everybody, and welcome to this ISAP webinar titled The Prebiotic Potential of Polyphenols. My name is Mary Ellen Sanders, and I'm the Executive Science Officer of the International Scientific Association for Probiotics and Prebiotics. ISAP is a nonprofit organization dedicated to advancing the science of probiotics, prebiotics, and related substances. We are so fortunate today to have two excellent speakers on polyphenols, Professor Dan Daniel Del Rio um, from the Department of Food and Drugs at the University of Parma in Italy, and Professors Yves Desjardins, Department of Plant Science at Laval University in Quebec. I would also like to introduce our co-hosts for the webinar, Professors Bob Hutkins from the University of Nebraska and Dr. Maria Weiss from TNO. Maria, before we get started, can you share with everybody the goal of this webinar? Yes, um, thank you, Maria. And the webinar aims to inform about the state uh, of knowledge on the prebiotic potential of polyphenols and also just to open up the discussion on the subject a little bit further. Thank you. And Bob, the possibility that polyphenols would be prebiotics was anticipated by the ISAP consensus panel on prebiotics. Um, can you comment on polyphenols and whether or not they're going to be able to um, enter the ranks of regular prebiotics soon? Uh, you're, you're right, uh, Mary Ellen. Um, at the time we organized the consensus paper, we considered polyphenols as potential prebiotics, but there was really not a lot of supporting data. But now it's five years later, and I'm looking really forward to hearing from our speakers today to tell us where we are now with respect to this very question. So, Maria. Yes, and now it is my great pleasure to welcome Professor Del Rio, who will provide some important background on polyphenols and their function in the gut. Thank you. I'm going to share my screen now. And let's see if it works. It worked then. Uh, so I have 20 minutes to tell you a lot about uh, uh, polyphenols. Actually, you're not going to hear a lot about the prebiotic effects of polyphenols from me. You're going to hear more about it uh, uh, from Eve just after me. Uh, but you will at least you know, get in the mood of understanding what polyphenols are and what's their health significance. Uh, this is a declaration of interest. My research team got a lot of funding from private and public institutions. Uh, I didn't get any individual or personal funding, so I don't have any, any uh, conflict to declare. So um, this is what you should expect uh, uh, from, let me reduce this, uh, from my talk. In my talk, you're gonna get a, a short introduction on polyphenols in plants. Uh, uh, then some evidence that polyphenols may provide health benefits, and then how the gut microbiota and polyphenols interact, uh, and then in the end, uh, uh, if do they, they, they do work for everybody or if there's uh, some sort of personalized response to this. So um, you can get here a picture of polyphenols in many different plant foods. Basically, they're everywhere in the plant kingdom, and they are syn synthesized in the plant kingdoms as a response to biotic and non-biotic stress. So Plants do synthesize these molecules more if they are under stress. This might be because they have some potential uh, fungal contaminants, uh, bacterial contaminants, or even if they're like too dry, it's, it's dry season, for example, or they're exposed to too much sun. All sorts of stress is actually triggering an increased secretion, not secretion, sorry, synthesis of polyphenols. So they do work in plants and they're plant compounds. But it, also, it looks like that they might also, they also be somehow beneficial for, for humans, okay? The other thing that you can, uh, you need to know, well, it's useful to know, is that the class of the, the class of polyphenols, I'm, I'm talking about more than 6,000, maybe more now, uh, different compounds identified uh, to date uh, are then mm, kind of classified into two macro classes, flavonoids and non-flavonoids, then uh, subclasses like flavones, flavonoids that have share uh, some, um, let's say, yeah, shared structures, shared scaffolds, but then differ for uh, particular uh, chemical uh, differences. And uh, we're interested in most of them in my research team, but there are some of them that are actually uh, somehow most attra more attractive and uh, possibly also a little more promising in terms of health benefits. What we know is that consuming polyphenols through the diet might be preventative in terms of many chronic diseases. So there are epidemiological data that show prevention of uh, stroke, uh, cardiovascular disease, uh, some types of cancer, metabolic diseases, and also uh, they seem to be able, if consumed regularly through the diet, to also slow down the typical cognitive decline that comes with aging. Uh, 
how this happens, it's still a matter of debate. One of the most recent evidence in terms of health benefits, and you see I'm covering in the first four slides, basically three quarter of my presentation. So I'm gonna go get into uh, a little deeper uh, into the concept uh, in the rest of my presentation is this uh, paper recently published on the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition showing that uh, a supplementation with two capsules a day of uh, uh, cocoa extract containing uh, 500 milligrams of cocoa extract, including 80 milligrams of eticatechin, which is a flavonoid in cocoa, and then also other flavonoids present there, uh, was able to really uh, reduce mortality and in particular cardiovascular mortality in a very huge population. We're talking about a case control study, a placebo control study with 20,000 people. So the definitely the most uh, robust study to date called the COSMO study. So they they do work. That's that's something like uh, we can consider a fact. So I'm also starting the presentation with some, uh, uh, let's say, I don't know, in Italy, we call them photo stories. And there are three people here, that three, three persons that are discussing. One says, trust me, with this cranberry infusion, you will get rid of all your UTI, urinary tract infections. And the other one responds, yes, she's right. And you need to wait until the end of my 20 minutes to know what the third one will say. So I'm trying to keep you, you know, concentrated and focused on my talk. The second uh, here, like story is this guy waking up in the morning and saying, why do I always wake up with this belly ache? It must be something I've eaten yesterday night, perhaps. But the wife seems to be sleeping. She looks like asleep, but she's not. And she's thinking something and you will hear about it at the end of the presentation. So um, this is what we do for a living. And it's uh, very much into uh, polyphenol research. We're interested in this pattern like food, how the human transforms food, in particular through interaction with the gut microbiota and how this interaction might impact human health. So I'm going to zoom in exactly what we do, plant foods, because we're interested in polyphenols in my team, how these compounds are actually then interacting with the gut microbiota. And you will hear in a minute why this interaction is so important, how the metabolites produced by this interaction are actually circulating in the human body and in what form and how this might affect, affect health in many, in many ways. So keep this in mind, we consider this step here an in the, an in, an, uh, let's, let's say the, the independent variable. Uh, basically, we're not interested in the prebiotic effect itself, like how the gut microbes change, but how the gut microbes modify polyphenols. So I'm always using this example of the, the tree. So think about the, this tree as, as, a, as a human being. I know it's, it's different, but uh, consider this, this uh, analogy. And uh, eating a little piece of chocolate, uh, the polyphenols contained in chocolate, which are a lot, but maybe five, six, seven compounds are actually the most representative, get into the small intestine, it's stomach and small intestine, and they don't really change. We uh, don't really have a lot of uh, potential to disrupt, to, to uh, let's say, modify chemically these compounds at, digest uh, at the level of the digestive tract, the upper intestine at least. They're not really absorbed. Only a tiny percentage is absorbed. We don't have any transporters that is fully dedicated to absorbing these compounds. So when this tiny amount is absorbed, it gets through the liver, through the port of circulation, and it gets metabolized at liver level. And in particular, it undergoes phase two metabolism. So glucuronidation, sulfation, typical things that happen to xenobiotics with hydroxy groups and polyphenols have a lot of hydroxy groups. So these metabolites then circulate and are then quickly excreted. We're talking about two hours, two and a half hours max to get back to almost nothing circulating in your body. But that's just the 0.1% of what you ate. If you consider the 99% of what you ate that has not been absorbed, it gets to the large intestine at a colonic level. It's where it encounters the gut microbiota. And there's where the uh, interaction happens, okay? So what happens there is that the microbes instead have a lot of enzymes able to really change structurally these uh, uh, molecules. Also because most, most of the times these molecules were synthesized in plants to try to counteract the action of microorganisms. So they're naturally antibacterial and the gut microbes have developed or they shared the capacity to break them down. So they form smaller metabolites by really cleaving the structures that were uh, consumed through the diet. And these metabolites are absorbed at colonic level, they get to the liver and they undergo the same pattern of metabolism, liver, human metabolism at that level. So glucuronidation, sulfation. But again, it's not the same structure as before. It's broken down structure 
fight the gut microbes. So gut microbes, enzymes, and liver enzymes are the most responsible for something like this. A few metabolic molecules are getting in and a lot of metabolites circulate. Now we know exactly which ones for most of the classes of compounds that are actually known to be potentially healthy. So we're interested in uh, one subclass in particular, uh, flavantriols. It's the same set of molecules that Eve will talk about for a couple of experiments in, uh, in the next uh, presentation. And we share this interest in research. That's why we're actually good friends too. So these are the main sources of flavantriols, uh, red wine, grape, uh, tea in particular, green tea, berries, uh, the cuticle, the skin of uh, most of uh, um, uh, dry fruits like hazelnuts, so most of nuts, and chocolate is another very good source of these compounds. So the structure that you can find in uh, the food product like wine or chocolate is this one, procyanidins and epicatechin. So flavonoidic structure, I don't know if you noticed it before in one of the slides, and even oligomerized. So you can actually get these molecules basically stuck together in, in uh, arrays and in, in lines. But then when they interact with the gut microbiota, and please don't be scared by the chemicals here uh, and the chemistry, they are broken down. And one of the most interesting compounds that is formed is this uh, dihydroxyphenyl valerolactone, actually gamma phenyl valerolactones in general. So we're interested in this metabolites because they're the one that get in touch with your uh, uh, organism. And if you want to know more, this is one of the, uh, I think this presentation is going to stay online for a while. So you can go back and check and, and look for this publication that describes exactly how this breaking down happens. So what happens in the body is that because of this interaction, you have a very, very peculiar pharmacokinetic. So you eat your piece of chocolate, for example, your drink, your cranberry juice, and you have a first tide of compounds uh, uh, rising up uh, for the first, uh, let's say, two hours and then going down but the Cmax, the concentration reach is very low. And then you have another tide that happens when the colon and the microbiota transform a phenolics and it's so much higher and also so much longer because it's the 99% of what you consumed and also because the colon keeps, uh, you know, the, the uh, digested food inside for longer period, for longer times with respect to the small intestine. So uh, this is actually what you need to look for colonic and then hepatic metabolites of polyphenols if you want to look for health effects. And this is what we're actually doing. You also need to consider, and I need to thank Dr. Professor Pedro Mena, a colleague of mine, uh, that uh, uh, the exposure to these compounds is actually multiple. You don't just eat a piece of chocolate a day. You drink your coffee, at least, at least me, I, I drink my coffee four days, four times a day or even more. So for polyphenols in coffee, for example, you're always continuously exposed. And this, of course, has an impact on health, or if you need to look for an impact on health, you need to look for this type of molecules. Unfortunately, when, when you look at the literature, you, you're going to see studies conducted like this, like coffee on cells and smoothies on cells or pomegranate extracts on cells to see what happens. Everybody forgetting that everything that is here in the pomegranate extract in the coffee or in the smoothies of berries uh, is transformed drastically, not by our enzymes, also by our enzymes, but in particular by the gut microbiota. So uh, the interaction in this case, the one I'm talking about is uh, the microbes towards the uh, compounds. So we've synthesized the metabolites we were interested in, we've synthesized a lot, and we're now testing their effects. So I'm gonna sh share, you, uh, share with you one example of uh, an effect. It's uh, in the, actually two, uh, it's in the, um, let's say, framework of the gut urinary tract axis. You might have heard that uh, cranberry procyanidins and cranberry extracts are used worldwide to try to counteract the occurrences of urinary tract infections. You've heard the three, well, you've read about the three girls speaking in one of the first slides I showed you. So it looks like it might be proantocyanidins in cranberries doing the trick. But now I told you that proantocyanidins, which is this flavanols oligomerized, are not really good, well absorbed. They're actually very big, so it's difficult to absorb them. But they are transformed by interaction with the gut microbiota into smaller compounds, the valerolactones. And these valerolactones are absorbed and circulate in your body. So it's interesting to know that we tested the capacity of these valerolactones in another work some years ago together with Begonia Bartolome from Madrid. And we proved that valerolactones are actually able in vitro to counteract the formation of a biofilm over uroepithelial cells. 
So basically, valerolactones in your urine are actually preventing bacteria to contaminate your bladder and your urinary tract, ideally preventing this. This means that there's a mechanism there, but it's not because of the compounds that were present in cranberries, but it's because of the compounds that the gut microbiota has produced through the interaction with cranberry polyphenols. So without the gut microbiota, this would not happen. And uh, another point is, instead of talking in vitro, I'm gonna talk to you uh, uh, about in vivo evidence. And this is one publication that got out, uh, uh, I think uh, a few weeks ago, and it's about cranberry again, improving endothelial function. I don't know if you know what endothelial function is. It's basically the capacity of your endothelium to react to an increased and enhanced flow. It's a good descriptor of cardiovascular risk. If you have elastic artery, let's say it's a little simplistic way to make it, but to say it, but if you have a, a, a elastic arteries, they react to an increased flow better. And this is actually a very way, a very good way to prevent, uh, uh, you know, cardiovascular disease in general, let's say, so if you're, Flow, blood pressure increases, you're more uh, resilient, let's say, a, a word that is actually very used these days after COVID or during COVID, I would say. Uh, so we uh, know that this is a good indicator of health and we uh, did study together with uh, another set of colleagues and in particular, Kristen Heiss and Hannah rodriguez Mateus, one in Surrey and the other one at King's College London, very good friends. Uh, we did this and we tested uh, the capacity to increase endothelial function when you consume cranberry juice, and it worked. Endothelium function acutely and chronically improved, ideally reducing your cardiovascular risk, okay? So this was a very well-conducted study, but the, interest, the interesting part for us that we're interested in gut microbiota here is that if you check in the very moment where the uh, endothelial function improved, the metabolites of the polyphenols contained in cranberries were higher in concentration in blood plasma. So basically, it's very reasonable to think that it's once again, the metabolites produced by the gut microbiota that really do the trick, ideally improving the capacity of our endothelium and our arteries to become, let's say, more resilient. So once again, without the gut microbiota, we wouldn't really be so protected by this uh, set of compounds. The however is that maybe we're not all the same in terms of reaction towards dietary polyphenols. And, uh, and this is also in very good line with the fact that we have very different gut microbiota. This is a known fact. The gut microbiota in terms of variance uh, is much, uh, you know, varied uh, with respect to our genome and our set of enzymes. And uh, so this uh, is a picture taken from a relatively old publication from a, a group of colleagues in Murcia, uh, run by Paco Tomas Barberan and Juan Carlos Espin. And they were the first one to prove that, for example, the transformation of polyphenols in pomegranate and raspberries and walnuts, which is another class of polyphenols, not uh, procyanidins, but elagitanins, is different depending on your gut microbiota. And now they also know uh, which bacteria or which specific ecosystem of bacteria are actually uh, able to make the transformation. So you might be uh, classified, clusterized in a, a phenotype, they called it, and I love to call it metabotype A, if you produce a certain set of metabolites, or actually better, if your gut microbiota is able to produce a certain uh, set of metabolites, phenotype or metabotype B, if you're producing another set, so if you're actually able to produce a molecule called urethane B, specifically present only in some of us, or a metabotype zero, not producing any metabolites out of the compounds that were originally present in pomegranate juice. And it looks like that the uh, percentage of gut dysbiosis is different depending on uh, what metabotype you're in. And it also looks, there are other publications in this, that also the cardiovascular risk you're actually exposed to is different depending on where you are. So really, it's not the same for everybody. You might actually get uh, more dysbiosis if whatever the, the word means, by the way. I know it's actually a very controversial definition, but, uh, but it might actually affect you differently depending on what metabolites you're actually able to produce. Interesting is that our genes are our genes, but our mi microbial genes are, uh, uh, you know, may change if you change the microbiota. So there were people during the studies with pomegranate, for example, that shifted from 
one metabotype to another from zero to B, for example, during the study after exposure for a month to pomegranate. So you can modulate this and ideally even trying to point to uh, address and, and try to get to the best metabotype possible. And we also proved that, that there's a metabotype, uh, let's say a possible clusterization in metabotypes, even when you consume procyanidin, so the molecules we're interested in. And this also opens up a, a, a very nice horizon of possibility. So just to conclude and to make a couple of final statements, what is the third girl saying? Well, she says, well, it doesn't work for me because possibly she doesn't have the right microbiota to produce the exact set of metabolites out of the procyanidins present in cranberries. And uh, this doesn't allow her to you know, prevent urinary tract infection. And what is the wife of this guy thinking while the, guy, while the, the husband is actually complaining about uh, belly ache? is, well, I know I should have married the other guy with a good metabotype because possibly is not in the right metabotype to avoid uh, gut dysbiosis and maybe some belly ache. The thing becomes a little more complicated if you consider that this difference is linked to the gut microbiota does not apply only to polyphenols. So I need to point this out. You might eat your apple and uh, if you consider the metabotype uh, in, in terms of colonic degradation, so microbial degradation of apple polyphenols, apple contains a lot of procyanidins like green tea and chocolate, you might end up in three different metabotypes, like one possibly associated with reduced blood pressure, one with unchanged, and one with increased blood pressure. And at the same time, if you consider another set of strategies to identify the metabotypes, you might get improved flow-mediated dilation, so endothelial function, or no effect. And then you need to add the fact that this also applies, for example, for meat, eaters, so omnivores producing TMAO after they consume meat, red meat, or equal producers, which consume uh, um, isoflavones from soy, for example, and just some of them are actually able to produce equal. And this metabotypes link to, uh, this differences link to consumption of different compounds that are transformed by our, by our gut microbiota overlap. And it's very complicated. So in terms of personalized nutrition, which is the future of nutrition, actually, I would say precision nutrition, we need to consider everything at the same time. And this is one of the big challenges in nutrition, I think. So uh, I had to stay in 20 minutes. I think I've also saved a couple, but I'm going to say a couple of words about my team that I need to acknowledge. I'm always speaking around, but most of these guys are actually the ones doing the, the work. And, uh, and I need to thank them all. Without them, I would be definitely less happy and uh, uh, also at the same time less productive and definitely not invited to, to talk to you people. Uh, but I also have to, uh, let's say, highlight uh, the possibility for you to participate next month, actually in a month and a half, uh, to the Food Bioactives and Health Conference, which will be held in Parma. And you might recognize top left of this slide, the same background I have in my, in my, uh, yeah, frame uh, during this conversation, during this webinar. And uh, it's about all food bioactives and how they impact or might impact health. We've been postponing this for like two and a half years now, but it's happening and the uh, registrations are still open. So if you want to come, you can check the website. It's going to be <coughs> extremely interesting. And uh, as I promised, I think I've stayed within my 20 minutes and uh, this is the end. So I'm um, then open for questions, I assume, at the end of Eve's talk. Yeah, that was that was great and great talk. And uh, now I'm happy to introduce Professor Desjardins, Desjardins, who will speak on the prebiotic action of polyphenol. So let's see if we can get your slides up. So uh, thank you again for uh, Mary Ellen and uh, for the invitation. And I'm gonna uh, try to uh, pursue the great talk that uh, Daniele just uh, gave us on uh, the action of polyphenols on uh, on health and uh, one of the mode of action, which is the prebiotic action of these molecules. Uh, as you see in my title, uh, it's prebiotic with a twist because when we consider the effect of polyphenols on health, uh, these effects are multiple. And uh, 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 Daniele has uh, shown uh, many of the effects uh, on uh, 
uh, many different uh, cardiometabolic diseases and chronic diseases, it, uh, either metabolic uh, diseases, cognitive decline, cancer, uh, etc. Uh, I've been working now in this area of polyphenols for the, the last 15 years, and uh, I'm always very surprised to see that these are uh, these molecules that we find in many different food, food compounds have what we call pleiotropic effect. They have many different effects that cannot be explained by just one, one uh, mechanism in, in the body. And if you look at the different classes of polyphenols that uh, uh, Daniele has shown, either, either stilvines, resveratrol, anthocyanins, elagic acid, and elagic tannins, and proanthocyanidine and oligomers of proanthocyanidine, you will find literature to show that all of these different compounds are, um, are having an effect in E e either one of these boxes, uh, either one of these uh, health effects. And when I see this, it gives me uh, 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 as an idea that there's a common mechanism of action of these uh, 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 polyphenols. And for about, I would say 30 years, we, uh, we claimed that these, uh, these compounds were called antioxidants for the first thing. And we now know that they're not, they, the action is not through antioxidant. Uh, we, the body is recognizing these molecules as, as xenobiotics, and that's their use in plants. They are antibacterial compounds in plants, and they do have the same action when we, we uh, eat them in, uh, or we consume them. They will be very actively metabolized as phase one and two uh, metabolites and excreted rapidly. They have thus very poor bioavailability. Actually, the, the pure molecule, molecules will probably be at a level of uh, the low micromolar and even nanomolar uh, concentration in, in the body. However, since they are poorly absorbed, 95% of these compounds are reaching the gut. Uh, either the lower um, uh, the intestine and the colon, and then they can uh, mix it, they can interact with the gut microbiota, either through a direct antimicrobial microbial effect, they can affect quorum, quorum sensing of the bacteria. They, are in, they, they can bind uh, ions, and in particular iron, and, and compete with the bacteria for these uh, minerals and they will affect biofilm formation. So uh, they do have an effect on modify, modify, modifying the ecology, and they will thus have a prebiotic-like effect. And I would like to distinguish this prebiotic effect from the prebiotic-like effect. And uh, if you look at the uh, consensus statement uh, that was published, uh, we just heard from Robert uh, five years ago, um, if you look at the strict definition of uh, the prebiotic is a prebiotic are defined as a substrate that can selectively use, uh, be selectively used by uh, the host microorganism conferring a health benefit. And this selection means that they can metabolize them in some way and, and some bacteria will benefit from the presence of, uh, of the, the, the polyphenol as such. And this is why there was this this box uh, where uh, polyphenol were kind of considered prebiotic, but I would like to, to probably say more uh, a prebiotic-like effect because as such, uh, the polyphenols are not really metabolized by the, uh, uh, by the bacteria in all cases. And you can see here two great types of uh, prebiotic molecules. Fibers are fitting very well this description because uh, the uh, luminal bacteria in the colon have a set of enzymes that uh, are carbohydrate degrading enzymes that can metabolize and benefit as a trophic substrate of the presence of these fibrous material. However, uh, the bacteria don't use necessarily polyphenols, that's what you see on, on the right, with a set of specific uh, enzymes that we could call, call them pazymes pa pa or polyphenol uh, degrading enzymes. Uh, even though they are present because bacteria are using the polyphenol to, to degrade and, and, and metabolize the compound. We can find, however, that uh, they are expressing 
glycosidase are uh, degrading the, 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 the sugar that are attached to these molecules because in plants all these molecules are not found most of the time free uh, in, 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 the, in the, the plant material but they will be attached to sugars and uh, the bacteria are synthesizing the hydrolyzing enzymes to use the sugar but not to use the polyphenols as such. And one thing we have to consider as well is that the, uh, the polyphenols are not floating in the lumen and the intestine, uh, in the intestine freely, but they are attached to proteins and to fibers. And we have a concept that we call polyphenolic fibers, where when we are eating fibrous material, we also just uh, having uh, at the same time fibers and polyphenols at the same time that are interacting with the bacteria. So this is one thing I wanted to set up at, at first. Um, so I think we have to consider the, the relation between the polyphenols and the gut microbiota as what we call a reciproc reciprocal effect, meaning that polyphenols have an antimicrobial effect, that's what we find in plants, and they will affect microbiota. And in turn, the microbiota, through the fantastic catabolism capacity that they have, they are expressing in our gut more than 3 million, uh, 300 million different genes. They have a fantastic uh, metabolic, metabolic machinery and they can degrade the polyphenols uh, at the same time. So we just um, recently published a paper where we try, we try to distinguish what were these two effects that we found from polyphenol. And we call the duplibiotic as a way of, uh, of uh, uh, expressing these two uh, mechanisms by which polyphenols can act on gut microbiota. And the first effect or the first mechanism is really an antimicrobial effect. And it is very well described that uh, polyphenol can uh, disrupt, destroy cell wall, cell bacterial cell membrane, can uh, have uh, interact with uh, bacterial DNA, with inhibit many enzymes, uh, cause nutrient calculation. I just talked about that, and they do affect current sensing. On the other side, they all they have a, an interesting prebiotic effect meaning that they can uh, advantage certain, certain microbes in, uh, in, the, uh, in the microbiota. They can uh, produce specific metabolites, and that's what uh, Daniele was referring to with the microbial metabolites of polyphenols. And very interestingly, and this is an important aspect, is that they can modulate the intestinal in environment in such a way as recreating niche that will be suitable for the growth of probiotic bacteria or, or beneficial bacteria. So you will have uh, uh, polyphenol will thus have a uh, prebiotic action at many levels. First, they can reduce gut inflammation, epithelium inflammation at the level of the gut. They will stimulate the production of bacteriocin by gut microbiota, but they will also interact with the host to produce defensins and condition the, uh, the, the ecological niche in the gut. They will stimulate the production of immunoglobulin and recreate a suitable uh, environment for beneficial bacteria. And one thing that we have worked quite a lot, and I will be presenting you some data, is that uh, we, I believe too strongly that these polyphenolic molecules have a strong impact on the intestinal barrier function. They will reduce gut permeability. And from this reduced permeability, they will lead to uh, improve uh, low-grade uh, inflammation in the body and the reduction of chronic diseases. And since these polyphenol can interact with specific bacteria uh, that uh, have an action on bile acid, well, they will affect the turnover of cholesterol in particular and thus have a, a, a downstream effect on many cardiovascular diseases. So this is really what I, these two major effects that you can distinguish. Uh, and we published a, a paper a couple of years ago on the prebiotic action of, uh, uh, of uh, the, the mechanism of probiotics. And uh, if you look, at these um, 
this mechanism, you will find that you can, uh, probiotics when you are consuming them, can have an impact on energy metabolism through mostly the production of short chain fatty acids, but also the synthesis of specific vitamins. They can uh, modulate uh, signaling pathways. They will have an impact on uh, bile acids. And very interestingly, they have uh, probiotics have a strong impact on mucosal barrier. They will modulate tight junction and improve uh, the tightness uh, and the, um, the uh, gut function. Uh, they will stimulate the production of mucus and they can prevent adhesion of, uh, to, of bacteria to epithelial cells. And also, and I will, uh, this is my last point here, they can improve immunomodulation, the recruitment of anti-inflammatory immune cells and the production of immunoglobulins. And all these effects that we find in probiotics will have an impact on the modulation of the gut microbiota population and diversity. And this mod modulation of the gut microbiota will have a strong effect on down, low, uh, decreased low-grade inflammation, in, improve uh, uh, gut barrier function, and modulate energy absorption afterward. Well, all these effects that we see that are beneficial from specific strains of, proba of probiotics can be uh, uh, associated with polyphenols and their prebiotic effect. So we kind of developed a, a model of uh, uh, what is happening when, uh, with uh, the Western diet and the problems that we find with many chronic diseases caused by this, uh, this Western diet. And you can see here in this uh, schematic, in this figure, that when we are, have a, a, a diet that is rich in fat, rich in fiber or poor in fibers and rich in uh, emulsifying agents, we are creating basically uh, an inflammatory pressure at the level of the gut enterocyte. Uh, and this pressure will have as an impact a decrease of many of the gut microbiota niche. And one of them is the synthesis of mucin over by, by goblet cells. And this reduction in the synthesis of mucin will uh, have an impact on the permeability. And once in a while, you will have a bacteria uh, from the lumen, from the microbiota, that will uh, enter the, uh, the circulation. And it will, these live bacteria will be attacked by macrophage and will release uh, lipopolysaccharide, which is probably the most inflammatory uh, uh, molecules that our body is recognizing, and this will call, call, cause what we call low-grade inflammation. And when you have poor diet, poor eating habit, well, over 30 years, let's say, well, you are increasing your risk of uh, uh, chronic diseases, and you will see all the, the, the disease that I was alluding to at the beginning of my talk. However, uh, when you are consuming fibers or prebiotic fibers. These fibers will be degraded by uh, the microbiota, will produce butyrate, which is the food, the food and energy source for the enterocyte uh, and the epithelial cells. And you will have a suitable inflammatory condition uh, providing immun, uh, immunostimulation and preventing uh, some of the inflammatory response. But it turns out that polyphenols have the exact same effect as fibers on this microbial community, increasing the uh, presence of mucus, but also synthesizing or uh, stimulating the growth of specific bacteria. And one of my pet bacteria is, uh, is Akermansia mucinifila, that is a mucifile bacteria that is stimulated by polyphenols and uh, is exchanging uh, signals with the epithelium and causing uh, or, 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 or being responsible for, for the beneficial effects. So we, uh, uh, you can see here all the different molecules that uh, Daniele was alluding to at the beginning. There are some small flavonol that can be metabolized and we still, we, we, we think now that these metabolites have a biological action, action when they are absorbed. I'm also, I, I strongly also think that these molecules like tannins, 
procyanidine, lagitanins, all those polymers that are reaching the colon have a specific action on either antimicrobial or modifying the, 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 the balance of the different mi microbiota and stimulate those bacteria that live in the mucus very close to the epithelium and Archaemasia being one of them, but we also find Ruminococcus, Lactobacilli, uh, Christen Selena, Ciospira, that are bacteria that are uh, normally found in healthy phenotype. And we know that these uh, molecules will uh, uh, stimulate the production of mucus and recreate a proper niche for uh, the uh, for, for uh, bacteria to thrive in this ecological niche. We also find that these molecules also have an impact on the mucosal immune system, improving the release of uh, chemokines that can improve the gut uh, barrier function and the epithelium repair. So these uh, molecules have, have an effect on the bacteria as such in the, uh, in the microbiota, but also on the immune system. So let me just show you a few examples of uh, some of the results uh, we've obtained to prove that uh, this is one of the way these the molecules are working for the uh, prebiotic action. So this is a paper we published in uh, 2015 uh, uh, in uh, the, the laboratory of André Maret a colleague of mine. And uh, this paper is now uh, being cited many, many times because we were among the first to demonstrate that uh, cranberry polyphenol, we, we just fed mice with a high fat diet or a high fat diet with the cranberry. And we showed that we were reducing uh, uh, LPS circulation in the body versus a high fat diet. And so we were improving the gut barrier function uh, of the uh, intestine. And this was uh, uh, conducive to uh, reduction in gain weight and improvement of uh, insulin sensitivity. And we also were able to show that uh, we were increasing the synthesis of defensins by the host to condition the, um, the, the gut microbiota and improving the synthesis of mucin uh, again. And this niche that is created, the one or two millimeter of uh, uh, mucin that are synthesized by the epithelial cell are a fantastic niche for Achermansia mucinifida, one of the key uh, keystone bacteria that uh, is considered now a, a, pre, a probiotic bacteria. And you can see that uh, after nine weeks, our Carb, uh, our uh, cranberry polyphenol are stimulating the growth of Achermansia mucinifida, uh, which is in growing in the mucin, while not changing the the, uh, the luminal bacteria, all those uh, bacteria that are the commensal and degrading the uh, the carbohydrate uh, within a large extent. And since we published this paper, I think uh, the literature has shown and repeated many many times the uh, these results. We find that uh, 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 different types of polyphenols in different uh, uh, commodities will stimulate the production of mucin and will also stimulate the growth of Achermansia and many other bacteria that are growing in this ecological niche. Um, to prove that the polyphenols were really causing this modification of, uh, uh, of the gut microbiota, and uh, were responsible for the beneficial effect that we were observing. Uh, we did a, a fecal transfer experiment uh, of uh, pro-antosanidine treated mice. And this was uh, an experiment we ran in, in two steps. The first step was to, uh, we were feeding blueberry polyphenol. That's what you see here, a high fat diet uh, 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 that we were providing to the mice, a blueberry fruit diet complete. And then we fractionated the different types of polyphenol, either an anthocyanin or pro anthocyanidine And we looked over uh, a, a period of 12 weeks, some cardiometabolic uh, effects. But if we did Eves, the two... Eves, let's try yeah. to wrap up in another minute. So we've got a lot of good questions we'd like to get to. I, I, will, I will do that. 
So what we did basically afterward is that we took fecal uh, pellets of these mice and we transferred them to uh, axinic mice, gnotobiotic mice, and we wanted to reproduce the, the, the uh, beneficial effect. And that's what you see here. In the first part, we saw an improvement of the weight gain and insulinemic response. And we were able to reproduce the same effect without polyphenol, but, but with the modified uh, microbiota. So this is just a proof that uh, these mole molecules have the capacity to modulate the microbiota and have an impact on, on uh, the uh, 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 metabolism. So I will wrap up to, with this slide here. Uh, we know now that polyphenols are important in cell signaling, gene expression, epigenetic regulation, modulation of many enzymes and miRNA expression, uh, responsible in many different diseases. We also, uh, we've also seen that it modulates the gut microbiota quite efficiently uh, through uh, mucus production, altering the gut ecology, uh, this is what I was referring to, to the prebiotic effect. This cause an improvement of the gut barrier function. It will create a, a specific consortium of bacteria in the, uh, in the uh, epithelium, around the epithelium. It will produce short chain fatty acids uh, that have benefit uh, in the whole body through gut liver axis. It has an impact on the immune system. So it's, it, it will have an impact on systemic immunity. And finally, the gut metabolites, as we have seen, uh, have an impact uh, on uh, gut brain, but also gut organs. It can be gut skin or uh, different uh, uh, inter-organ uh, uh, effect in the body. Uh, so in a, to wrap up, take home message, polyphenol reproduce the effect of uh, pre and probiotics and provide beneficial effect on several physiological contexts. They influence the gut microbiota in a niche and region specific matter. They does have an antimicrobial effect. They have affect the host response and they uh, will induce a niche alteration providing uh, 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 trophic uh, substrates for uh, bacterial growth. And finally, polyphenol interact with the gut microbiota to influence many aspects of uh, human health from innate immunity to control of appetite, mood, energy metabolic, metabolism, etc. And uh, this is my team. Uh, and I, this work uh, that I've presented is mostly funded by uh, a uh, Chair, I'm, I, uh, I have. It's called Pheno Bio Plus. It's the Insert Dana Food Research Partnership Chair on uh, poly, a prebiotic effect of polyphenol. So on this, I will quit here. And I think Robert, that uh, we we can we're open to question uh, Daniele and I. Very good. Thank you very much. That was a great. Both of those were were just great seminars, and we've got a lot of uh, real interesting questions. So. Um, uh, we'll go to the first question. I think that's for Dan. Um, very interesting. Do you see a role for personalized polyphenol advice? This is in relation to responder and non-responder profiles. How then can we measure who is a non-responder? So that's actually an interesting question. We're not uh, uh, ready to go uh, you know, that deep into the uh, pers personalized or precision nutrition, but we're trying to do that. So consider that this science is evolving so the, the guy that you, you saw in one of my slides, uh, Pedro Mena, recently won a very uh, prestigious grant, and it's completely focused on that. And to understand who is a responder and a non-responder in terms of production of certain metabolites, you need to challenge the person. So you need to feed the person with an extract, for example, uh, 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 cranberries, and see what are the metabolites produced. You can look for them in urine, in the 24-hour urine. So you know what metabolites these guys produce. And then you can clusterize and then run an intervention study separating them. All the science in nutrition has always uh, addressed the, the population, but we're not all the same. So I think the future of precision nutrition will be to try and separate this. And to separate and to clusterize, you need to challenge acutely. So you know what? where to put, in what metabotype to put people. And there will be more metabotypes in the future, I'm sure. I don't know if I answered correctly. Yes, thank you. And there's another question. For instance, do polyphenols affect pH and redox potential in the gut? 
And one could also ask, uh, does this effect differ somehow from the metabolites that can be produced by the microbiota from polyphenolic compounds? Yeah, Eve, well, do you want to get there? Oh, yeah, you um, I, I, I personally think that indeed these uh, molecules uh, have the capacity to change the redox potential uh, in, in the gut and not when they are absorbed. And that's the big difference uh, from the, the previous mindset we had. And uh, indeed, uh, if we are in the condition of dysbiosis, I was, I was talking about this, uh, um, this uh, uh, Western diet uh, feeding, it's a very inflammatory uh, condition and it will probably cause uh, uh, oxidative stress at the level of the epithelium. And we know that polyphenols can uh, have their antioxidant uh, action at the interface between the epithelium and the lumen. Uh, in the intestine. So again, yes, uh, indeed, this could be one of the mechanisms of these uh, these molecules as well. Okay, I think we'll go back to Dan. Um, this is on the, the cocoa study. And for the life of me, I don't know why anybody would want to take a cocoa supplement when you could just have a have chocolate. But um, there, there were several questions about the dose of the, of the, the, the cocoa necessary to, to elicit an effect. So if you comment on that, and, and I think we were also had some issues about matrix effects and whether the, if the cocoa is in a chocolate bar and, and how it's how that matrix may affect it. Well, you're absolutely right. And uh, consider that this uh, study, it's public, so I can say it was sponsored by the NIH and at the same time by a private company, Mars Incorporated and Mars Edge in particular. So uh, I don't know why they decided to go for a capsule instead of chocolate, but I think it's in, scientifically, it's a matter of standardization. They had to standardize perfectly what was in the capsule because they had, it has to be 90%, 90 milligrams of epicatic in it. But, but you can easily get to that uh, amount uh, of procyanins with uh, a, well, an okay amount of chocolate. The problem is that chocolate comes with other nutrients, including <laughs> fat, for example. And, and that's, and, that's and that sugar. might actually, yeah. and sugar, exactly. Well, it, you know, uh, fat and sugar, you're right. I don't think you can really completely get rid of, of fat. You can almost completely get rid of sugar. Uh, if you like bitter stuff, that, that might be your choice. Yeah. But, uh, but uh, and that also includes the matrix effect. Uh, if you think about milk chocolate, for example, there's some seminal work from friends uh, Mauro Serafini, for example, a very good friend of mine that came out with the idea that milk chocolate is not as good as the dark one because maybe catechins, uh, you know, bind to proteins in milk and you don't absorb them. Okay. They, they didn't know about the metabolites back then. So it's a different story now. Uh, but yes, uh, I also read stuff with very tiny amounts of chocolate and blood pressure and it worked. So I think chocolate is one of the sources where you can really get an advantage. If you don't eat too much, you can still get an advantage. Thank you. So which polyphenols would you say have the strongest, most beneficial impact on the gut microbiota so known so far? Um, <laughs> first, yeah, it, most of the work uh, that has been done until now uh, were on this class that we call flavan triols that uh, we find in chocolate, we find in cranberries, in what, what, what are considered the, uh, the condensed tannins, those that we find in, in, uh, in cranberry, in, uh, in, small, in many red fruits, uh, in uh, almonds uh, and, and uh, chocolate. And uh, the, the most compelling evidence are coming from these, uh, these sources of polyphenols. But now uh, we're starting to see a lot more data uh, coming from another class of molecules that are not absorbed in the body as such, uh, that we call elagi tannins, that we find in other commodity like strawberries, but also mango uh, and uh, other sources like pomegranate. And these are very heavily metabolized uh, and uh, will produce specific molecules that we find uh, either as metabotypes and they could have uh, different uh, health effects. So I would say uh, consuming many fruit stores, uh, you, you either get the elagitanin or the tannins as such. You also have uh, anthocyanin that are also reaching the gut and could have meta beneficial metabolites. Uh, so if you consume these, these, molecules, these uh, commodities, you will have a proper source of these polyphenols. 
maybe Dan, Dan can. Uh, uh... No, I think I think you said you said it all. Very good. So, um, so uh, Eve, Zan, Dan, both of you um, kind of drifted towards this topic, and then there's a there's a question in in the Q and A also about um, symbiotics. Combine, you know, so for a non responder to convert to a responder, maybe they need the right microbes along with the polyphenol uh, food. So, can either of you or both of you comment on 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 the role of symbiotics um, and polyphenols? Uh, Eve, can I can I go first? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so uh, I think uh, I also read a question about the stability of the metabolites. Okay, so the, the good thing is that you can change uh, you can change your metabolite, your cluster, your classification, your you know your position. Also, just by eating repeatedly the same, as I mentioned for. Uh, the Elagitanin study and, and the group of Murcia in Spain, they show people changing during the study. So basically, when you when you send in the the stuff, the, the Elagitanin, you select somehow, and again, the prebiotic concept might actually also fall there, uh, uh, select some of the, uh, the species that are able to transform and to produce the specific metabolites. I guess that, yes, the symbiotic might actually be another uh, strategy uh, if we uh, uh, assume that we finally understand and get a, a clear idea of what, what are the uh, um, you know the, the species and the strains that are able to do the trick and then of course you need to make them completely totally resistant to the digestive tract so they need to get down there to colonize and then to act which is I know not an easy thing to do um, so um, if, if we if we thinking about a food, if we're thinking about supplements and capsules, then of course everything can happen. And uh, as soon as we know, because for some of them, we know exactly what to look for, what bug we need to target and what bug is doing the trick. For others, we still don't know. For example, for the valerolactams, we know some of them, but not all of them. And uh, uh, that's another very quickly developing field uh, of, of nutrition and, and microbiology. And, um, yeah, Eve, before uh, Eve, before you before you comment, I just want to alert our um, the the audience that um, we're at the top of the hour, but we're going to go a few minutes extra because we got started a few minutes late. So we'll go a few minutes extra. So um, maybe we'll go five more minutes. So Eve, go ahead. Yeah, I will comment on uh, two interactions that we find between polyphenols, uh, uh, a symbiotic and a postbiotic impact of these molecules. First of all, uh, we've, uh, we are showing right now that you can uh, have specific association of typical uh, uh, polyphenols with bacteria. And we have a nice example of uh, um, polyphenols or elagitanin that can be degraded from with lactibus, uh, lact lactobacillus plantarum in particular and release some uh, polyphenols that have a, a beneficial impact on, on health. So you have this interaction and then we are talking about the development of symbiotics. But we also know quite well that we can model, modulate the physiology of the bacteria of the gut microbiota with the polyphenol and induce either the production of bacteriocin, which uh, have a, an effect, but also can stimulate the growth uh, or the release of specific molecules by the bacteria. And I'm thinking of Achermacia mucinifida, with, uh, uh, a species with uh, which I, I work, and we know that polyphenol will stimulate the production of exopolysaccharides, and these exopolysaccharides could have an impact on, on the host uh, uh, immune, uh, immune cell and uh, generate uh, the conditions uh, for uh, uh, providing uh, uh, health, uh, health effects afterwards. So both a pre uh, a symbiotic and a postbiotic impact. Great, thank you. There's more questions in the chat. Um, one interesting one is uh, could be used in vitro studies to optimize formulations for symbiotics, for instance. And also, do you know if the polyphenol content changes in food uh, through cooking? Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to take uh, a, a first response to both of them. Uh, first, uh, I'm going to concentrate on the in vitro, in vivo concept. Of course, in vitro doesn't mean that things are going to work then when you eat 
this stuff. So uh, in vitro is a good screening way to understand what are the molecules that work and, and how they work. But then, of course, uh, it's always a very big surprise when you transfer everything, when you scale it up to in vivo studies and you get a lot of disappointment there. Uh, the only thing I want to point out is that what we're trying to do when, you, when we work in vitro is to work to conditions that are in conditions that are as much physiological as possible. So using the exact metabolites that you find in vivo, which is not the usual stuff when it comes to the literature, if you check polyphenols is a very present and, and widespread word in the scientific literature, 90% of it is absolutely unreliable because they use the wrong molecules. They didn't consider the metabolism. So the right molecule and also concentrations. I saw there was a question about concentration and levels that are in line with what happens in vivo. So you can't use micro, high micromolar or millimolar concentrations in an in vitro test if you know that what is circulating is nanomolar concentration which is something that Eves pointed out very clearly in his very nice presentation. And uh, uh, cooking, of course, cooking changes the content of things in what you're cooking. The good thing is that polyphenols are actually pretty stable. So unless you really overcook and you burn your meal, uh, most of these polyphenols are very thermostable. So you will eat them anyway. And let me add one last thing. I, I read something about, you know, supplements and, and, and a variety of diet. I'm, all, I'm a nutritionist, so I'm always in favor of a variety diet. You need to eat a balanced and variety diet, your fruits and vegetables. That's the best way to get. So you get your fiber, you get your polyphenols, you get your vitamins, you get satiated because you get a lot of water. And so I, I'm not really pro supplements in general, but sometimes if the molecules are the right ones, I think it might be worth to investigate supplements too. And the COCOA study that I just showed you, the COSMOS study, is one good example of that. So Maria, if, uh, I, I will comment on one thing. Uh, in vitro uh, uh, can be interesting and when you have the good model. And uh, one of the models we are using uh, in my lab uh, through the chair uh, on prebiotics effect, we're using uh, artificial uh, uh, digestive system a system that is called the shine. So we are able to reproduce the different parts of the intestinal tract. And we are using organoids and simulation of the epithelial cells to try to understand the interaction between the gut microbiota and the, uh, and the, uh, the, 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 the cells in culture. So we are trying to find the best, uh, the best match to, in order to study because we cannot go and poke a different part of the intestine in human. We only have access to one source of microbiota and uh, that's the end of the digestive system. But uh, uh, using in vitro model, you can go in the uh, jejunum, you can go in the ileon, you can go in the different part of the colon and try to understand what's happening at this level. Okay. I want to thank Mary Allen for organizing this. I really want to thank our two great speakers. This was a great um, uh, webinar. And uh, hopefully, um, as Dan pointed out well, er earlier, that we won't be doing these webinars forever and we'll, we'll get to meet in, in person. There's a lot, there are a lot more questions that we couldn't get to. Um, so if, if Dan and Eve want to take a quick look at those before we close the webinar, um, um, maybe you can yep. contact those people individually. So I want to thank all the participants uh, that joined in. There were well over 100 people on the webinar. Um, thank um, Maria for uh, co-hosting this. Uh, thank you all. Thank you so much.